Good evening. evening. Welcome to each and every one of you. Welcome to First Orthodox Presbyterian Church of South Holland. Glad that you could join us this evening for worship uh, as we come on this special day, uh, Good Friday. And what a wonderful Savior we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who went all the way to Calvary to die for our sins. And uh, so we gather tonight in His name to remember uh, the price that was paid for us, to thank God uh, for all that He has done for us in and through His Son to give him proper worship in light of it, and uh, to gather around the table as well. So we are glad to see each and every one of you uh, here tonight, and hope that you feel welcome among us if you're visiting with us. Let us ask God's blessing as uh, we gather for worship with a prayer of invocation. Let us pray. Great, holy, and mighty God, we gather this evening, a special night in which uh, your people gather. We remember that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified at the sixth hour, the Friday before the first day of resurrection. And uh, we think upon him and gather in his name, uh, struck and in awe of the beauty and the wonder of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, we fall down before you, worshiping you as the Lamb who was slain, and ask that you would look kindly upon us once more in your tender compassion and mercy, and grant to us a full measure of your Holy Spirit that we may know your word and trust you as Lord and Savior, and might be built up in faith and hope and love. O Father, May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. To the only God who lives and who reigns, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. If you're able, please stand as we begin our worship service. We begin by receiving God's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and the operation of His Holy Spirit. Amen. A call to worship, responsive reading is printed in your bulletins from Revelation 5. Let's hear from God's Word. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Remain standing as we sing number 350 in the blue hymnal, 350 in the Psalter hymnal, all four stanzas, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Amen. Please be seated. We read the account of Jesus' trial and crucifixion as it's found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, beginning at verse 11 of Matthew 27. The scripture reading can be found on page 991 if you're using the Pew Bible in front of you. Let us hear from God's holy word. Let us hear of the sacrifice of our Savior. Matthew 27, verse 11. This is God's holy word. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, 
and the rocks were split, the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. The grass withers and the flower fades. God's word endures forever, and he had his blessing to its reading. Amen. If you would take the Blue Psalter hymnal and go to page 23 in the back, the numbering starts over in the back section. We remind ourselves of what all these things mean. I'll read the questions of Lord's Day 16, and we can read the answers together in unison. Lord's Day 16 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Beloved, why did Christ have to go all the way to death? Because God's justice and truth demand it. Only the death of God's Son could pay for our sin. Why was he buried? His burial testifies that he really died. Since Christ has died for us, why do we still have to die? Our death does not pay the debt of our sins. Rather, it puts an end to our sinning and is our entrance into eternal life. What further advantage do we receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross. Through Christ's death, our old selves are crucified, put to death, and buried with him, so that the evil desires of the flesh may no longer rule us, but that instead we may dedicate ourselves as an offering of gratitude to him. Why does the creed add, he descended into hell? to assure me in times of personal crisis and temptation that Christ my Lord, by suffering unspeakable anguish, pain, and terror of soul, especially on the cross, but also earlier, has delivered me from the anguish and torment of hell. Great reminders of the work of our Savior at this time, our choir will come and minister to us in song.
Thank you, choir. As we go to prayer for just a few uh, minutes, I want to just mention one thing that we'll uh, try to remember in our prayer, I will, that uh, there was a pretty bad accident here on South Park a, few, a couple of hours ago. Jennifer Borsma, our own uh, Jennifer Borsma, was involved in that accident, so uh, she was awake and cognizant and everything after the accident, but they did take her uh, to the hospital. She thought maybe her arm was broken. Uh, pretty pretty bad accident right outside of uh, the Ken's tax office down there just south on South Park. So we want to pray for her and, um, and remember those involved too as we go to the Lord in prayer. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we do come now to say that Jesus is a wonderful Savior. What a Savior. That in our place condemned he stood. And we have come to remember that tonight and to be reminded to commune with you through Jesus Christ and, and uh, to leave here built up and assured of your love for us uh, because of all that he has done. And Lord Jesus, we, uh, we thank you for this price paid that we have just uh, read in the gospel and have sung together and have heard sung for us we can never uh, too much be reminded of all of these things, and we can never have it too much at the center of our minds. So help us to, uh, to put you, Lord, right at the center of our lives and uh, of our hearts, that, uh, that we might always understand that we are crucified with you. It's no longer we who live but you live within us. And the life that we now live in the faith, uh, the life that we now live in the body, we live by faith. In you, O Lord Christ. O great God, forgive us and renew us. We have erred, strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have broken your law, forgotten your commandments in thought and word and deed. Cleanse us. Forgive us of all that is displeasing to you, particularly as we come to the table. We seek a humble and contrite heart upon which you look favorably. And we thank you that uh, you give us this new and living way to approach you. Bless the ministry of your word in this evening hour. Bless us as we gather around the table that we may eat and drink in faith, trusting not in ourselves but in Christ. We do uh, lift up our sister, Jennifer Borsma, to you, even as she is at the hospital now. Uh, we thank you that she was awake and uh, sitting up. But we do pray that whatever they may find, that uh, she might be able to have those difficulties dealt with. We know that their family has had much um, on their plate and in their minds in recent months and years. We thank you for the encouraging news of Laura recently, but we do give this situation into your hands and uh, cause them to, to look to you even as they grow weary with uh, the challenges of this life and this world. Help us all to look to that celestial city of which we are made citizens through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray for this offering that we now receive for the Committee on Ministerial Care. We thank you for those who, who care for ministers in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We think of those who are retired, perhaps those who need extra financial support in retirement to pray that they might uh, gain the help that they need. And uh, as, these, uh, as the deacons come to receive this offering, would you give us generous hearts uh, unto, unto this work. We thank you for all of these things. Most of all, for Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. We take our offering now. As mentioned, it's for the uh, OPC Committee on Ministerial Care. As we take the offering, the choir will minister to us once again in song.
Please turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Our Old Testament reading is just one verse. Isaiah 53, 9. Isaiah 53, verse 9, God's holy word. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Amen. And turning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. Chapter 27 of Matthew, verses 57 through 66. Once again, God's holy word. Matthew 27, verse 57 through the end of the chapter. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who was also a disciple of Jesus, he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite to the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come humbly before your word and ask the help of your Holy Spirit that we might understand this word, might trust and love you more and go forth, ready to pursue new obedience through your grace and power. Amen. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we admire when we see it in other people virtues like perseverance, resilience, or your favorite ball coach phrase, stick to when we see it in other people, those who when faced with a challenge or a hurdle, seem to rise to the occasion and push through and still accomplish what they set out to do. We admire when we see these things in others. And we have in this passage uh, several examples of resilience, perseverance, both positively and negatively, in Joseph, in the women, in the chief priests and the elders. But most importantly, we see the saving resilience of God that he will stop at nothing to save his people in Jesus Christ. Because we know that's true, we take great comfort and joy as we walk through this world knowing that we are called to walk the path of Jesus, to go outside the camp, as Hebrews says, to suffer with him, to bear reproach like he did, even as Joseph and the women willingly show that they are ready to do so here in this passage. We can do that because God has stopped at nothing for us, so we are free to give our all to Him. First, let's think about Joseph and his resilience and his stopping at nothing to love his Lord. Who was he? Well, we we read that he was a rich man. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Hopefully, you noticed in Isaiah 53 that That's really where Joseph helps fulfill the picture of Jesus, that 
he gives his grave to Jesus, the grave of a rich man. Now, he's been quiet about his following Jesus up until now. The Gospel of John gives us a little more of a peek into that. But here he emerges ready uh, to bear reproach for the Lord. What does he do? Well, very simply, he gives Jesus a place to be buried, and he is willing to put himself on the line as he goes to Pilate and explains the situation and says he is willing to take care to become the custodian or the steward of the body of Jesus. Now, this massively complicates things for the Jewish leaders. Those who were executed as criminals, uh, their bodies, their remains would have been in the hands of the Romans, and the Jewish leaders would have expected that that would have been the case with Jesus. But now, all of a sudden, everyone knows where the body of Jesus uh, will be laid, or at least many people will. It's unexpected that Joseph would have done this. It's unexpected that someone would have stepped up to vouch for someone who has just been crucified to go and speak to Pilate on behalf of a criminal is even more unexpected. It's unexpected because someone who is condemned and executed as a criminal must be buried alone. His grave cannot be shared, and these kinds of expensive graves that Joseph donates to, to Jesus, to the body of Jesus, would have been something that likely would have been shared by many people in Joseph's family, not just himself, but others as well. And so we read that this is a new grave and very expensive. It's close to Jerusalem. It's kind of a prime spot where someone would have been buried, and this would have been something that only the wealthy could have, have afforded. He steps forward as a member of the Sanhedrin, and that probably was, was very significant to Pilate as he sees someone come forward from that judicial body that has sought to condemn Jesus to death. Pilate would have noticed that. In other words, Joseph was prepared to face the hostility of his colleagues. He sided with the Christ. He gave him his own grave. In other words, he was courageous, he was brave, he was faithful, he was loving, he was devoted, all of those things. He stops at nothing to serve Jesus in this way, to honor him in this way. Why? Why does he do it? Something brings Joseph of Arimathea forward. Something compels him to come out of the darkness in his following Jesus into the light of day and say, yes, I belong to him. Yes, I followed him. Yes, I loved him. And surely it can be nothing short of the stunning, captivating, wonderful resolve that he had seen in Jesus as Jesus suffered. He beheld Jesus on the cross, and it changed him. It changed Joseph. Seeing Jesus on the cross changed him. He comes forward and is willing to bear approach for the name of Jesus. He gives up his grave, which is such a, a beautiful picture. He, he gives something which was meant for him. It had been set aside for him, and he gives all of it to Jesus. Remember, in his mind, it will only be Jesus who is laid to rest there, and he gives all of it to Jesus, that which would have been served to, or that would have been to serve him in his death, which is such a wonderful picture, a spiritual parallel, which allows us to connect the dots and say, that which belongs to us, not only in our death, but in our life, if we live like Joseph lives, we come to give all unto Jesus. We dedicate it all to him, just as he dedicates all to the Lord. As the cross changes Joseph of Arimathea, so the cross must change us, brothers and sisters. What did we sing tonight? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present or that were an offering far too small. If I had everything in this world, it still would not be enough to give. And yet love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul and my life and my all. Has the cross changed you? And does it bring you out of the dark into the light, just like it did for Joseph to say, yes, I follow him. Yes, I love him. Yes, I serve him. 
Joseph had so little compared to what we have in terms of guarantee of salvation, of hope, of eternal life. All of that was hanging in the balance here in these hours, the 40 hours between Jesus' death and then his being raised to new life. It is, isn't it true that we have so much more, so much more to hang our hat on, knowing about the resurrection, knowing about the eternal life that Jesus gives? Has the cross changed us the way it changed him? Secondly, the women, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they are sitting at the tomb. Why? Well, it's a posture of mourning. They are mourning the loss of Jesus. Uh, moreover, they are unwilling to be anywhere where Jesus' body is not. Remember, these are the women who sat at the cross and were watching it all unfold, even as the inner disciples, the twelve, the eleven, have fled. And there's some reports of John coming back to the cross in the Gospel of John when Jesus speaks to him from the cross, but generally, they're nowhere to be found. Yet here are these women. Just like Joseph, this is a risk. This brings them directly into the ire of the Jewish religious leaders. Yet here they are. Joseph stops at nothing to come into the light to serve Jesus. These women stop at nothing to be found close to him. They want to be close to the body of Jesus as they mourn, as they pray, as they ask God, what will happen now? Their presence also adds consistency and connects the narrative. There they are, there these women are at the cross as Jesus breathes his last. Here they are sitting, the bur sitting to watch the burial as Jesus is placed in a new tomb. And they will be the first who are there at the tomb on Sunday. They will become the first witnesses of the resurrection. The tension that's created by their constant presence is heightened and can only be relieved when Jesus appears to them. They're constantly there, these women, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, and it heightens the tension, pulls it tight, can only be relieved on that Sunday morning when Matthew says, behold, Jesus comes to them. These women mourn because they can't understand this death. Death was a, an ever-present reality in that society. I can guarantee you that these women have dealt with death a lot in their lives. They know that God is the Lord and the giver of life. They know that the Psalms say man's days are 70 years or by reason of strength 80 years. They can understand death. They can't understand this death at this time. And in this way, this is more than they could have understood. But their longing to be near the body of Jesus speaks so much of their faith. This is a time unlike any other. This is quite literally the time in between promise and fulfillment. We, we will never achieve this, this time in redemptive history again. It, it's never going to happen. We never rewind the clock, even as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus on Good Friday. We don't rewind the redemptive clock and don't live in light of his resurrection still. We can be reflective as we think about Calvary. We can be floored by the price of our salvation, the Son giving himself, the Father giving the Son. But we never rewind the redemptive clock in that kind of way. Jesus is on the throne. He's still the King of kings, and he's still sitting in session in heaven. But these women so, show such faith in this singular time, and that tells us something about what they will feel as they behold the risen Christ on Sunday. So just as it does with Joseph, does not this level of love and devotion convict us? Your diligence in seeking the Lord will always be connected to the degree of joy that you will have when you behold him face to face. These women who are so diligent in seeking him, Hebrews 11, God is the rewarder of those who seek him. And when so much is unknown, doesn't it convict us? Their love and devotion. Those who seek him in this life are all the more prepared to enjoy him hereafter. You see that devotion that resilience in them.
What about the chief priests and the scribes? We come to these religious leaders who will also stop at nothing, but they are animated by a very different set of motives. After the death of Jesus, there were all these incredible signs that accompanied his death. There's an earthquake. Well, there's darkness as he hangs on the cross. There's an earthquake. The curtain temple is torn in two. There are other historical sources. We don't know if they're true or not, but some of them mention that that Saturday, as Jesus' body was in the grave, that some people were going to the tomb and waiting outside of it because there was so much curiosity around everything that had happened with this mysterious crucifixion. So it means that something needed to be done on this Saturday. Now think about the Gospel of Matthew. You, you who have been here the last three and a half years, we've been going through this Gospel. Pretty amazing to think about, isn't it? We've been going through Matthew for three and a half years. How many times has the Sabbath come up? And how many times have the Jewish religious leaders emphasized particularities about the regulations on the Sabbath? Many times. And now here, you, here we are on a Sabbath, and what do they do? They seemingly break their own regulations to go into the headquarters of Pilate to make sure that they address this situation. They'll stop at nothing, even if it means breaking their own Sabbath regulations, even if it means they will have to now hold back from observing the rest of the feast, it's the feast time, because they've entered the headquarters of a Gentile ruler. They break their own regulations in order to keep Jesus down. They go to the tomb. They obtain the guard. We read in Matthew, their main concern is the prediction of the third day. They must get to the third day, and then they think we can discredit anything after that. So they seal this massive stone. The, these stones would have been uh, on a decline down into the opening of the tomb so that if you wanted to get into the tomb after the fact, you probably would have needed several able-bodied men to push the stone back up the incline. They seal it with some kind of clay-like uh, cement mixture, and uh, they set the guards there. Pilate says, do everything that you think you know how to do. There seems to be some mockery in Pilate's response. You have a guard, do whatever you want, do whatever you think you can do. But as we read this with Christian eyes, how futile does it all seem? Their actions reveal their unbelief and uh, their ignorance. Are their meager efforts anything in relation to what's going on? We're talking about eternally cosmic things going on that far outstrip their own efforts and purposes. Son of God, who has given himself to go all the way to death in order to defeat death. And so how futile does their clay mixture seem? How useless does their guard of soldiers seem in these moments? In many ways, it's parallel to the, the unbelief, the ignorance, and the futility of all of those who reject Christ today. Those who reject Christ, they don't understand what's going on, do they? They don't realize that eternity hangs in the balance as it comes to Jesus Christ. People who think that they captain their own ship, that they can write their own destiny, when there are cosmic forces beyond their comprehension, always at work, eternity always in the balance. But the chief priests and the elders will stop at nothing in order to reject Jesus, the giver of life. So Joseph stops at nothing to serve Jesus. The women stop at nothing to love Jesus. The chief priests and elders stop at nothing to stop Jesus. Our triune Lord stops at nothing to save us. You talk about the futility of everything that you see here with what the chief priests and elders are doing. And there seems to be in the background of Matthew 27 and 28 the language of Psalm 2 that even in chapter 28, as the chief priests and the elders take counsel together, there's that connection of Psalm 22 where the kings of the earth take counsel together, rejecting God's dominion, rejecting God's rule, rejecting God's power and authority. And what does Psalm 2 say? The one who sits in the heavens laughs. He says, 
I have set my king on Zion. No matter what any earthly or heavenly or cosmic power outside of our triune Lord would want to do, God's decree never changes. His purposes are always accomplished. And what he wills is always completed. And so you see all of the machinations, all of the efforts seeking to stop him, and how futile does it all seem. Nothing will stop Jesus from being raised from the dead. And the burial here in Matthew 27 is thrusting our attention forward to, to, to that very event, isn't it? But if nothing will stop Jesus from being raised to the dead, brothers and sisters, being raised from the dead, brothers and sisters, then nothing will stop our triune God from saving those who trust in Jesus. Nothing will stop him from saving and preserving and glorifying those who trust in our Lord. John Calvin says this, This is our acquittal. The guilt that held us liable for punishment has been transferred to the head of the Son of God. We must above all remember this substitution, lest we tremble and remain anxious throughout life as if God's righteous vengeance, which the Son of God has taken upon himself, still hung over us. If we wallow in fear and despair, acting as if wrath and judgment is still upon us, we're not rightly grasping all that Jesus has done for us. What will God not do for us who has given us His Son, as Romans 8 says? Is Jesus not able and willing to save all those who come to Him, all of those who place their trust in Him? As John Owen says, will Jesus not relieve us in all our distresses? Will he not do all for us that we need so that we may be eternally saved? Will he not be our sanctuary? Do we have any reason to doubt his power? Those who come to him and doubt his power and willingness to save, Owen says, have not faith in them. Resilience, perseverance, these are virtues we admire. We see it in Joseph of Arimathea. We see it in the women. We see a measure of it by counterexample in these Jewish leaders. But if we can describe it in such a way, though our God never changes and though he is ever the same and everything proceeds from him perfectly just the way it always does. But if we can describe it in such a way, the saving resilience of our triune God, that nothing will stop him from saving those who trust in Jesus. And nothing could stop Jesus from being raised from the dead. May we look to this one, the Lord Jesus Christ, and may we take comfort in his willingness and power to save and the God who keeps us by his grip for all of those who hide themselves in Christ. Hide yourself in the Savior. Look to him. Trust in his work on your behalf. And if you do so, you can be assured that your sins are forgiven and that you have eternal life in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we now ask your help as we come to the table and we give this time into your hands. And we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ, which we stand in awe of in these moments. In his name we pray. Amen. You can follow along as we read in the bulletin. The form is printed in your bulletin. Hear the words of institution in Matthew 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Our Lord Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper as an ordinance to be observed by his church until he comes again. It is not a re-sacrificing of Christ, 
but is a remembrance of the once-for-all sacrifice of himself in his death for our sins. Nor is it a mere memorial to Christ's sacrifice. It is a means of grace by which God feeds us with the crucified, resurrected, exalted Christ. He does so by his Holy Spirit and through faith. Thus he strengthens us in our warfare against sin and in our endeavors to serve him in holiness. The sacrament further signifies and seals the forgiveness of our sin and our nourishment and growth in Christ. The bread and wine represent the crucified body and the shed blood of the Savior, which he gave for his people. In this sacrament, God confirms that he is faithful and true to fulfill the promises of his covenant, and he calls us to deeper gratitude for our salvation, to renewed consecration, and to more faithful obedience. The supper is also a bond and pledge of the communion that believers have with him and with each other as members of his body. As scripture says, for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. The supper anticipates the consummation of the ages when Christ returns to gather all his redeemed people at the glorious wedding feast of the Lamb. As we come to the Lord's table, we humbly resolve to deny ourselves, to crucify the sin that is within us, to resist the devil, and to follow Christ as becomes those who bear his name. It is my privilege as a minister of Christ to invite all who are right with God and his church through faith in the Lord Jesus to come to the Lord's table. If you have received Christ and are resting upon him alone for salvation as he has offered to you in the gospel, if you are a baptized and professing communicant member in good standing in a church that professes the gospel of God's free grace in Jesus Christ, and if you live penitently and seek to walk in godliness before the Lord, then this supper is for you, and I invite you in Christ's name to eat the bread and drink of the cup. At the same time, God's word says, Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. If you are not trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you are not a member of a faithful Christian church, if you are not living penitently and seeking to walk in godliness before the Lord, then I warn you in the name of Christ not to approach the holy table of the Lord. This warning is not aimed to keep the humble and contrite from the table of the Lord as if it were for those who are free from sin. In fact, it is for sinners that our Lord gives this supper as a means of grace through the elements of bread and wine, our Lord graciously gives himself and all his benefits to everyone who eats and drinks in a worthy manner, discerning the body of the Lord. It is one thing to eat and drink in a worthy manner. It is very different, however, to imagine that we are worthy to eat and drink. We dare not come to the Lord's table as if we were worthy and righteous in ourselves. We come in a worthy manner if we recognize that we are unworthy sinners who need our Savior if we consciously discern his body given for our sins, if we hunger and thirst after Christ, giving thanks for his grace, trusting in his merits, feeding on him by faith, renewing our covenant with him and his people. Let us examine our minds and hearts to determine whether such discernment is ours, to the end that we may partake to the glory of God and to our growth in the grace of Christ. Come then with joy and thankfulness to the Lord's table. The Lord's Supper is medicine for poor, sick souls. Come to Jesus and find rest, refreshing, and nourishment for your weak and weary soul. Let's stand together and say the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed can be found on page 3 in the back of the blue hymnal. Once again, the second set of numbers in the back of the blue hymnal. The Apostles' Creed we will say together in unison, Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remain standing as we sing number 352, 352, same hymnal. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. On the night on which he was betrayed, Jesus Christ, the Lord, took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, now give to you. Thus receive it as from his hand. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you, taken and eat in remembrance of me. We'll wait until we've all been served, and then we will partake together.
the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, remember and believe that his body was broken, that you might be made righteous before God. In the same manner, he took a cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I give this to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Thus, receive it as from his hand. We'll wait until we've all been served, and then we'll partake together. The outer rings contain wine. The inner rings contain grape juice. Please take according to your conscience or preference. Blood of Christ shed for you. 
take, drink, remember, and believe that his blood was shed for a full forgiveness of all your sins. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we give you humble and hearty thanks for you are welcoming us to this table in the name of Jesus Christ. Minister to us even in the coming hours and days as we think upon the bread of life and remember all that he has done and place him, Jesus Christ, at the center of our lives. To you, the only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who lives and reigns forever and ever. In the name of Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand together and sing number 351, the Trinity Psalter Hymnal 351, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Amen. Receive God's parting blessing. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory and honor 
forever and ever. Amen.